Let's look at a calculation of Moran's I and local Moran's I for COVID-19 rates within the census tracts of Ottawa. So the first thing I do is I'm going to just, um, I have my geo database, Ottawa underscore COVID dot GDB, and it's stored in my temp folder. So I'll just make a reference to that. And the layer is CT 2016 that I want. So I'll load that in, I'm gonna call it C tract for census tracts equals ST read. And then I'll use um, the path, which is C temp, and the name of the geodatabase, Ottawa COVID.gdb. And the name of the layer is CT 2016. I'm just going to run that. Make sure that works. Okay, good. So it's reading it read right in the layer the way I wanted it to. 196 features, 15 fields. Let's look at the fields here. I'll just say um, uh, names, C tract. So these are the names of the fields. So we have the CTYD, which is an identifier, median income, visible minority aboriginals, status, university education, public transit, immigration, or immigrants, number of immigrants, number of non-immigrants, um, some AITF, that's the total number of cases, the counts of cases within each of the um, census tracts. There's also uh, COVE-RT, so that's the COVID rate, the cumulative rate of COVID, um, which is the uh, sum AITF field divided by the population 2016 times 100,000, so it's in rates per 100,000. So that's the, our field of interest is the COVID rates right here. I uh, will have a look at that. So that, check it out with the Coral Pleth map, see what it looks like. Call this uh, C tract LYR equals TM shape. And that'll be C tract plus TM polygons. And I'll say the, the column I want to map here is COVR2 like so, and I'll do a print on that. Didn't want to bring that all the way down there into a second line. There we go, COVID RT, and then I'll say print C tract LY for layer. Run those. Okay, so let's, so this is, um. It's using, I think, natural breaks as the default. So I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. And one way I like to do that is go just save image. And then I can bring this box and just maximize it. And redraw it in there nicely. Oops. If you go too far, it disappears. There we go. Okay. So I can see that better. So rates are generally low especially in the, um, the suburban regions, zero to 500. And then as we get into the, I should say the rural regions are quite low, the suburban regions. Um, this is Led, Ledbury Heron Gate right here, which is quite high. And it's kind of been still in the inner, within the green belt. So it's more of the older city boundaries, the more intensified population density areas. Now that we've seen the distribution of the COVID rates in terms of number of people infected cumulatively uh, per 100,000, the next step is to see if there's any missing data and remove any missing data prior to doing any analysis. So here, I'll just check in just in the, in the um, console window, I'll have a look at uh, the C tract, um, I'll just say, is dot na c tract c tract um, dollar sign and we'll have a look at the COVID rate here at the back cov rt uh, we can see that in that in there there are some trues there's one true there 
So there's at least one of the polygons or census tracts that has missing data. So what we want to do then is remove that just using a basic um, subsetting. So I'll just say C tract here equals C tract. Say not use dot NA and then C tract dollar sign call bar T. And then a comma here because I want all those rows. So it says, give me all rows that are not NA basically. Since is dot NA returns true for any particular value that is missing, that is NA, no data, then not is dot NA, is dot NA returns everything else. Instead, since we don't want just that one, we want not that one. So it's a quicker way to get a subset by just negating. Since we want all, there's so many that are false here that are not NA, we want all those ones to be true and, the, and then we want the true one to be false. And that's what this not is dot NA does. So I'll just run that. And then I'll go back and double check. Is dot NA COVID RT or COVID COV RT. I don't see any more trues in there. So that's good. So now we have um, just those ones, the NA ones. And I'm just going to copy and paste the view again, just to replot it. Since we've changed C-Tract and see where those. Uh, so it's just this one right here. The one that was gray before um, is now white. So it's just not there since there was no data for that one. It was suppressed. Any, any data less than five people or five cases is suppressed by Ottawa Public Health. So next I'll make my um, neighborhood matrix. So I'll call, let's call it NB equals poly to NB. And then the C tract is going in and queen, queen equals true is default. So I don't need to put that in necessarily. And I'll just run that. So now I've made my neighborhood matrix and I want to check it out and B. So I'll just say summary and B like so. So the first important thing that we see is we see no zero in that row. So that means there are no disconnected regions that we have to deal with. So that's good. Um, five polygons only have two neighbors each. Um, nine have three neighbors and then four neighbors, five neighbors, six, seven, all the way up to seven between four neighbors and eight neighbors, there's about an equal amount of about 36, 37, 32, like so. So a lot of the polygons have between four and eight neighbors and the average of neighbor links is six. And you can kind of see why that is because it falls in that grouping of very large numbers of polygons. So six is the average number of neighbors. Um, and that's important. So we had a look at that. Now there are some that are super connected like 24 and some that are six. And so we, we have varying numbers of neighbors, which means when we convert this to a weights matrix, we're gonna, we're gonna wanna use a uh, row standardized matrix to try, kind of try and even out that effect of, you know, 24 versus two neighbors, so to speak, in some way. And it tells you which ID is the most connected. That's 106. So census tract, in the census tract table, the row 106 has uh, the polygon census tract with the most links. Now we can view that, have a look at that on top of our um, layer here. So we wanna look at the neighborhood graph on top of there just because it allows us to then see you know, if there are any weirdly connected things, things that we should, we think shouldn't be there that are connected. So I'll make a, a neighbor layer, let's call it an NBLYR. And that will be equal to TM shape. And in here we'll have, so in, in the TM shape, we wanna have, we have to do this to neighbor to lines, NB2, two, two, lines. So we're changing the neighborhood into lines, the neighborhood matrix into lines. And then in here, NB, and then the coordinates that'll be connected by the lines, which are the 
uh, which in our case will be the polygon centroids. So here we'll just say chords equals ST geometry. And then in the ST geometry are C tract, like so. And they'll say plus, oops, plus, plus. Um, and I'll put the plus on the second line here just so it's all in one, you can see it all. So the neighborhood lines, so the TM shape will be the neighborhood lines, and then we want them to be plotted as TM lines. So, and then we can print that with print. Uh, I'll print the C track layer, which we're seeing right now, plus the NBLYR, like so. So I'll just run those two lines now. There we go. And I'll just have a blow that up again to have a look at it. Using that save as image and then the save plot as image dialog. And then just expanding that. Not too big. Don't release your mouse till you have it expanded. Oops, there we go. Okay, good. There we go. So now we can see that larger. So one important thing here is that all the lines, so all of the lines emanating from a given polygon are looking inwards. So for example, this polygon uh, out in Cumberland, so that's uh, the Eastern part of Ottawa, uh, right there, you can see that it has only two links, one to this neighbor and then one to a neighbor, a neighbor over here. Then these ones here, you can see that's three links, one, two, three. So it's three neighbors. Uh, this one here has three neighbors, one, two, and three, etc. We don't see anything coming from the sides that might indicate sliver polygons along the edges or something, which is always something to look for when you're working with data. You don't want to have um, tiny little polygons that you can't, you know, that are a few <clears throat> hundred or thousand square meters in size at this scale uh, along the edges or something that would be pointing inwards. Okay, so that looks pretty good. So I'll close that. I'm not gonna say I don't need it, but you could save yours, obviously. So the next thing is we're gonna convert that to a spatial weights matrix. So I'll call it WT as the weights matrix equals um, NB2 list W. And then in parentheses here, our neighborhood, or I should say our adjacency matrix NB probably a neighborhood matrix just because it's but the adjacency matrix NB uh, style. Again, we want to have W. That's the default anyway, but let's put it in and zero policy equals true. So that'll stop it if there happens to be a, a non-connected polygon in there. Although we've seen already that there isn't, but it's good to have that there as a double check anyway. I'll hit enter, <clears throat> control enter to run that and it looks good. I'll look at summary of WT and we see the same things. Five have two links and you know that, that one has 20, 24 links over there. Everything looks the same, good. So we now have our spatial weights matrix. All we need now, we can undertake our analyses. So first let's do a regular Moran, uh, Moran's eye to see what the global spatial autocorrelation is here. So I'll call this um, COVID CT equals Moran.mc. Then in here, I need to put in the attribute from C tract that I want to test and that's the COVID rates of RT. And then the spatial weights matrix WT. And the alternative here is greater. So it's doing it again, the, the, it's looking for, it's a one-sided test. So we're looking for positive spatial autocorrelation, which again, is the most likely thing that we would see here. And the fact that we, we don't see, you know, a lot of same and then different, or I should say high, low, or anything in here, we tend to see census tracts with the same sorts of values next to each other. It's a, it's a good enough hypothesis, I think. And then um, NSIM equals 999. 
so 999 of those to get that and I'll just hit enter and that only takes a second less than a second and I'll look at the results in the console window okay so the Monte Carlo simulation number of simulations 999 plus one is 1000 the statistic is 0.36 so that's again meaning that we have um, you know uh, moderate or less than moderate positive spatial autocorrelation, so it's 0.36. And the observed rank is 1,000. So that means that the, our observed Moran's eye uh, did not occur in any of the simulations other than itself, basically, when we added it, that extra one in up here, when you add it to the reference distribution. And the p-value there is a significant, since we did 999 simulations. That's one over 1,000. Um, let's have a look at the variable itself. Let's just do a histogram, hist of the cove RT, or I should say not cove RT, but the um, C tract of cove RT. <clears throat> and then we can see that's skewed. Um, it would be best if that was normally distributed. So I'll look at that as a C tract, um, and I'll do a square root transform on that. So I'll just say the power of 0.5. And that normal, normalizes fairly good. What about 0.25, fourth root. Not a big gain over 0.5. In terms of normalizing it, it's not that great. So I'll keep it at 0.5. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rerun my Morans. Uh, more anti global with the, the um, square root of the COVID rates. So, like that. So, I just put a greater than to the power of 0.5. Not greater than, I should say, I, I put a chevron, the, the elevation symbol on the English keyboard at shift six to the power of 0.5. In the right place. Actually, I should put 0 0.5 just to make it. Um, more obvious that it's 0 0.5 and you don't miss that dot. And we'll run that again. And I'll look at COVID CT. Okay, so the only thing here is we get a slightly um, a near 0.4, a more anti near 0.4. So it's, you know, again, moderate, no big change, still uh, significant. If I ran it um, 10,000 times, just under 10,000, obviously, we'll check that out. I want that to happen. Shift, I hit, I hit shift instead of control. Control enter, that'll take a second or two more. And then I'll just check that out. And so still, yeah. So still the, the Moran's eye is, you know, 0. 0. 0. 0.000. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.0001. So it's significant. To do the local Morans and start to look at that then to see if there's already any, any hot spots or cold spots in the data, I'm going to go to my exercise eight and I have to load up the, the local Moran.mc function right here. So I'm just going to run that. So that's available to me. So now that's loaded into this session here, I can go back to my script that I was working on and I can do the same thing. I'll call it uh, local, local, um, local dot cov COVID equals um, local Moran dot mc and in here are the same things i'm going to put that back down to 999 simulations instead of 9999 and then i'll hit enter control enter anyway let that run and there we go 
So that's uh, finished. Names. COVID. Because I think it's a list. Yeah, so uh, look at the. So we have here results, raw, and more and scatter. So to look at those, um, I could say, for example, uh, head um, local.covid dollar sign results. And that just shows me the first um, <clears throat> six lines here. So we have the local more anti values for each polygon. And then we have one sided p values. And then we have what's called a false detection rate, one sided. And those look a little bit different, you know, than the regular one sided. And then two sided and false detection rate two sided. The false detection rate two sided is a compromise between the overly conservative Bonferroni correction that you have to undertake when doing multiple testing, because basically here um, we have, you know, 190 or so census tracts, and we're testing a hypothesis at each one of those. So just by chance alone, you know, maybe 10 of those or more would be significant, even if it was just random data. And so these false detection rates, p-values, they correct for that particular um, issue. Partially, you know, not so much as a Bonferona, not so bad as, um, um, not so, you know, it's a, so it's a compromise type of multiple testing um, measure for p-values. So it adjusts the p-values according to multiple tests. And you can read about it more if you um, just Google it. So false detection rate, FDR. And then it says quadrat here, and uh, again, it'll it's based on the um, I think if I remember, I based it on the two sided values, or no, the one no, that's based on the one sided values because generally, um, you are finding or you're looking for significant departures in any given direction, so above, below, or none, so high. Uh, surrounded by high, high surrounded by low, low surrounded by high, and low surrounded by low. So high, high and high, low and low are positive spatial autocorrelation types, and the other two are negative spatial autocorrelation types. And you, what you care about is that direction. So you're basically hypothesizing, although you're not pre-specifying, so it's, a, it's cheating a little bit here to say that you know we can use a one-sided um, p-value but it's safe, I think, in the context of this local spatial autocorrelation, since we're also doing the, the false detection rate correction on the p-values. But there may, it, might, it might still be a somewhat um, conservative test in this, in this way. So let, we can look at some of these. We'll plot some of these. So I'll just go back to the exercise eight because all the, all the examples in there for the plotting are, and you don't need to retype them out, just need to change the inputs and outputs. Um, so for example, here we have the, this is the reference distribution showing for, uh, not for our data, but our data would look very similar to this. And whenever it finds one, we'll try it with our data. So I'll just bring that over, copy that over into the other script window. And what we need to change here, fcpolys.mc. I don't think we have an fcpolys.mc, or do we? That'll be local COVID. Raw. Um, so wherever we see the fcpolys.mc, we put local COVID. Um, that should be good. Run that. And I'll go to my export here. Save as image. Make that bigger.
Okay, here we see uh, just, this is just an example of, I think a random or how, which numbers are the first ones. It's just a sampling of the individual for every polygon, what its reference distribution is and what it's observed local Moran's eye is. So you can see for this reference distribution for that polygon, um, you know, it ranges between, you know, negative uh, 0.5 to 0.5. This is a Z standardized value uh, here. And the observed is way off. So it's extreme with, reflex, with regard to that distribution that you see right here. So we have an extreme case. And so that would probably show as significant in one-sided or two-sided. But here we're just interested in the fact that it's to the right, which means it's positive spatial autocorrelation and it's bigger than any of the values that the reference distribution has. And again, remember the reference distribution is created by randomly shuffling the entire map around that polygon while keeping the value at the polygon constant. So again, it's a conditional randomization for each polygon. Um, whereas you know this one here, or most of them anyway, uh, you can see that the reference distribution and the observed overlap quite a bit. So in the, in the first case here, and then right below it, we have two significant ones, most likely. Um, also this one right down here and all the other ones are probably not significant. Certainly the ones where the red line is well within the histogram. This one right here, um, kind of mosing around, uh, that one's a little more difficult to just say that's not significant. We'd have to see the numbers. But those are all taken care of in the computations. This is just to illustrate the reference distribution and how each value observed is compared to that reference distribution. And then I'll go back to exercise eight here. And the next thing, of course, is the Moran uh, scatter plot. <clears throat> and what I'll do, I'm just going to rename. So just to make it easy to run the code, uh, I'm going to call local COVID. I'm going to call it whatever it was over here. I'm just going to rename. That's not the one. Uh, where is it here? Okay, place scatterplot variables. So fcpolys.mc, I'm just gonna call fcpolys.mc equals local COVID, like that. That way I don't have to change the, um, the name every time I want to do some of the plots in exercise eight. So I'll just make that X and Y. This is for these uh, more as scatter plot. And then I'll, that should be fine. Let's just have a look at the code first to make sure that it's not using anything other than fcpolys.mc. And it's using X and Y, which we just created there in quads. So that's fine. And there's our more as scatter plot right here. So we can see is a number of significant ones, which are in red. And these are the IDs of the rows. If you wanted to check a particular one out. And then if we put, of course, a, the, um, a regression of the spatially lagged variable and the variable itself, a regression, the slope of that is, is global Moran's eye. Um, and then we can do a plot, just make sure, I think down here we need uh, blind labs, slope. So this is one that adds a slope to it. Just see the global warrants. I, we already calculated that. It's right there. And that's the same as what we have in moran.mc. Um, no. Or what do we call our output? We called our output for more uh, COVID.CT. So, so COVID.CT. See, 39.318, 39 39.318. So, the same values, the, the global Moran's eye, because that's what you see on the scatter plot. Uh, where was that? Where'd the exercise go? There it is. So there it is, that's our Moran scatter plot with the regression line. And that slope of the regression line is global Moran's eye. And of course, these are the quadrats, right? 
we have low high, high low over here, both low high and high low are negative spatial autocorrelation results and high high and low low are positive spatial autocorrelation results. So any of the numbers in the high high region have high next to high. And if we go back up here, if they're red, then they're, they have a p-value less than 0 0.05. And so we see it well in here as well, just showing the quadrats. And again, low high means cold spot and high low means a hot spot. So we can now plot those um, here. I'm gonna make sure, I think we're using fcpolys.sp. So I'm gonna copy this one over. So I have to change some of the values in there. fcpolys.sp, I need to change to the variable that we have, which is uh, C tract. So I need to bring it over here to do that. I don't wanna uh, mess up my master exercise pile. Uh, so we have already renamed our, our results to FC polys at MC, so that's good. Quad layer. Uh, we need C tracks here. Census tract, polygons, quadrat, cat, FDR. Okay, so that looks good. So let's run that. Um, what was the problem there? Just a quadrat. So I got an error here, fill argument. I don't even see the call quadrat. Oh, this has to be up here made into uh, C tract. There we go. Try that again. And then I'll look at that. Save as image. And I'll just use that little window as a means to expand the size of the graph. Oops. There we go. So we can see here that um, we have some significant high high values over here so positive spatial autocorrelation we have some hot spots which are the high low ones right here in light orange and then we have some low highs cold spots in the blue so in the blue ones for whatever reason census tracts around them tend to have higher than normal um, covid rates and then in blue, uh, our low low. So our positive and spatial autocorrelation is blue and red. The negative spatial autocorrelation is orange and light blue. The light blues are cold spots, the orange are hot spots. So those ones are interesting and you know to look at or to, to have a to figure out, okay, well, what, what's happening with these particular census tracts? you know, um, socioeconomically, for example, uh, as to why they're, you know, cold spots and hot spots. That can help us understand some of the, perhaps the, some, some of the reasons for which, you know, COVID um, is not easily, not easily acquired by the people there versus why it might be more easily acquired by people in the hotspot regions and not around them. Likewise, equally interesting is the high high and low low. So why are the why is it high here and low over here? And hopefully none of this is due to uh, non-stationarity in the data. Because if there is non-stationarity in the data, then this particular um, analysis would be invalid. It didn't look to me like there was any strong um, trends in the data, but maybe I'll go back and have a look again, you know, at some point. 